Hi, this is Maha Bailey from the American University in Cairo, and with me is Irene. Hi, Irene here. Uh, happy to be here. Um, I'm an online facilitator with this. And hi, my name is Autumn Keynes, and I'm an instructional designer at the University of Michigan Dearborn. Um, we are uh, kind of combining two different um, things today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a technique, and then we're going to use um, the thing about this technique is that you can pair it with lots of different types of introductory content. The technique is something that we call pass the ball. And basically, um, the facilitator sort of, the facilitator, the teacher of the session sort of opens up the idea of introductions and passes the ball to somebody who hasn't gone yet. And the idea is yeah, each time um, that somebody has the ball and they introduce themselves, they then have to um, pass the ball to somebody who has not gone yet. And there's a little bit of desirable difficulty here because I think it encourages um, you to pay attention because you know that the ball's going to eventually come to you and that you're going to have to pass it to somebody who hasn't gone yet. I do want to say that the facilitator needs to pay attention overall and shouldn't shame somebody if they do lose track. Just help them along, coax them, and let them know who hasn't gone yet. So we're going to use that technique, and I will turn it over to Patrice to tell us um, the, the, like, the, the package that we're going to put that in. Hi, I'm Patrice, and I'm the Associate Director of Learning Design and Technology at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And the um, question that I'm going to pose today is, how do you make rice? And um, one of the advantages of not being able to sleep and waking up in the middle of night and reading Twitter is that you learn all sorts of super interesting things. And I actually, I wish I could remember who had posted this on Twitter, but I did originally see this on Twitter. Um, and I used it recently in a, um, a community building session, and it was just really interesting to hear not only the different ways that people cook rice, but it just brought in so many different aspects of um, you know, people's lived experiences. So I will kick us off. Um, so growing up, I was in a single family household and I was raised by my dad. And so the way that we cooked rice growing up was minute rice, those little packets of you know, of minute rice. And um, in my adult life, um, my I have two, well, they're now graduates, but I had two D1 athletes. And so rice has become, or any carb, right, has become a huge part of our household. And we cook a lot of rice and we actually get these like 25 pound bags of rice. And my daughter now just estimates, right? She pours a little bit of rice in and a little bit of water and just magically it comes out. It comes out just perfect. And I will pass the ball to Irene. Um, I, think, I, I think I'm a little off. Can, can someone else go before me, please? OK, I can go. <laughs> um, so, so you could just call on someone, I guess. Uh, I, I, I don't know if this activity, like, what's the way to do it. But anyway, I'll, I'll go next. Um, so I'm Maha and I don't like cooking rice. So I've, I've lived in lots of different countries and you don't find Egyptian rice everywhere and different kinds of rice cook in different ways. I remember when I was in England, I once found this kind of rice, long grain, because Egyptian rice is short grain, a long rice, long grain rice that comes in a packet that has holes in it and then you put it in the water and you get it out and it's always perfect. I don't think it's minute rice. It takes a little bit longer than a minute and you just put it in the boiling water, but you never have that problem of it getting soggy. You don't need to stir it all the time. I don't like sitting or standing in front of a stove. So you're getting to know a lot about me right here. I just like to put stuff in the oven and get it out like half an hour later or, whatever, or however long. But you know, I don't like to just stir something and check on it and get the temperatures up and down. And, and I don't enjoy reading, eating rice that much either. So I'm kind of like, why am I going to have to go through all that trouble for something I don't even like to eat? But my kid likes rice. So the other day she asked for it and I made it for her and I hadn't made it like in ages. Uh, like I have someone else do that for me. You know? um, but anyway, and in Egypt, we often put rice with vermicelli. I don't know if this happens in other cultures. But then when we have people who have uh, gluten intolerance, you have to be really careful because you can't put the vermicelli with the rice. Like rice is great for gluten intolerance, but vermicelli isn't. So that's also something that I've always got in my mind. I'll pass the ball to Autumn. 
So um, I cook rice in lots of different ways. I like to cook. And um, I've got a lot of different rice recipes, but um, I really like that Patrice started with her childhood kind of rice recipe, so I'll go, I'll do that. Um, my mom makes this thing called a chicken bog. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this, but basically it's a, it's a whole chicken that you cook kind of halfway through, and then about halfway through the, the cooking, you put rice in it, and then the rice kind of, you know, cooks and, and rises and, and puffs up all around. So the chicken is bogged down inside of the rice, and they call it a chicken bog. And, you know, she just puts, like, you know, some seasonings in there, some salt and pepper, and um, it's just a, it's a, uh, it's a childhood memory of mine, and she still makes it to this day for us, and everybody loves it. So I will pass the ball to Irene. Oh, rice, rice, rice. Um, well, number one, I don't like cooking at all. I, 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 I just don't, I associate it with a lot of things. Um, so, so I don't like cooking. However, I found that um, I can actually make very nice when I, when I have my hat in it, I can make very nice rice called pilau. Um, pilau is, you, you all know about pilau. You mix all these herbs and you you fry the, the onions really nice and everything. But one of the things that I add that most people don't add in my in my pilau is that I add uh, uh, tomatoes, and it always tastes different. And every time someone tastes my pilau, it's usually different because I add my tomatoes. And and uh, People ask me why I put them, and I say because nobody else does, and why shouldn't we put tomatoes in my, in my, in, in my pilau? So that is one of the things that I think my nephews and my nieces and my son really enjoy when I cook, but because I cook it from the heart. Now, when I boil rice, it is just that. I even sometimes forget how, uh, forget to put in salt. So that's how bad I don't like cooking. But, but I think um, rice uh, for us was considered as a, as a luxury. Uh, as I was growing up, it was a luxury. Um, so not very many people cooked it. So when you did cook, it was a big deal. And, and so, you know, the things that you don't get used to when you're growing up, I think they don't become uh, big things for you. So rice, mm, what what we eat most is something totally different. We call ugali, which is another story for another day. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. I enjoyed this. Patrice, did you want to comment? Yeah, that, that was great. And I one of the things I wanted to share um, when I did this with some colleagues that I learned and had never heard of is um, when they cook rice, they put the rice in the pan, and then they fill it with water and stick their hand in, and when like the separation between the rice and the water, I think is like to this part of your finger. That's when like, you know, you have the right amount of water. Um, so oh. that, was, that was really interesting. But yeah, I think, I mean, even just with the four of us, we learned a lot about each other that, you know, might not have come up with different types of stories. And so I think it is not something that you would think would bring about so many interesting stories and so many aspects of our lives and our either enjoyment or not of cooking. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that one up. Um, and Autumn, I, I want to ask you a question because we were talking earlier about um, how people, it might be difficult if there are like 20 or 30 students to remember who's already gone and who hasn't gone and you said the facilitator can help. Um, and there's, there's a feature that I think might exist in other tools but definitely exists in Zoom. If you go to the participant list, someone after they've gone can click on the yes. Can you guys see this green yes? So if you wanted to make life a little bit easier for them, uh, could other people try it? And then it'll, it'll, we'll see how, if, if everybody oh, can see the yes. Most. I thought you said yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the green S. I don't see a green S. The green, oh, the green yes. Oh, okay. With the, with I the see. Check mark. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that yeah, could work. Or like they could rename them large group. Yeah. Like I think where it becomes cognitively difficult, like the, especially because of the pandemic and Irene has her hand raised right now, which I'm not sure if she's just playing with that or <laughs> trying to say something. But yeah, you could, or you could rename yourself that you've gone or 
or like rename yourself with something that you said so people can remember you like we were saying in another video yeah so mm -hmm. it's yeah so i think yeah we could say like it would you would use your judgment depending on um mm -hmm. on how many yeah i think it i i think it needs to be a balance and um I, I think really the, the, the key is to be flexible, right? And to help students through this and, and make it a fun activity that um, just helps folks to get to know one another. And Autumn, if you had a large group of students, would you use breakout rooms? Like, have you ever done it like that or? If it was really big, I could see <clears throat> um, like explaining the technique to students mm -hmm. and then putting them into breakout rooms and having them do the breakout uh, having them do it in the breakout room themselves. Um, just as a way, because the, the other thing I worry a little bit about in breakout rooms is that you have some folks who are maybe a little bit more shy, but also some other folks who just like to talk a lot. And so um, this at least gives them a structure to encourage that everybody gets a little bit of time to talk, right? I guess you could, if you put them in breakout rooms, give them the instructions and then send them broadcasts every minute, time for the next yes. person, time for the yeah. next person, and that makes sure that yeah. hopefully. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Let's stop recording. <laughs>